Good evening. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, this is the first of our speakers in a, the annual speaker series that the Lowell Area Historical Museum puts on each year. Let's see if I did something wrong to the back row here. Um, over the course of the year, we present four to five speakers on different topics in local history. And tonight, we are thrilled to be able to have a local Lowell resident here to present on um, something that is near and dear to his heart. And so um, on behalf of the Lowell Area Historical Museum and the Michigan Historical Society, who is helping to support this um, series, um, I'd like to introduce to you tonight, Captain Timothy Alfson, who is captain of the Edwin H. Gott. And he is going to share with us tonight his experiences sailing on the Great Lakes. I'll turn it over to Timothy.
All right, I'm not used to the microphone, so I'll do my best. If you guys can't hear me, just uh, just say something. Um, I'll be happy to uh, uh, answer any questions afterwards. I'll stay as long as you guys want. Not a problem at all. So Evan, if you got questions, be happy to talk to you. But um, but uh, when I ran through it earlier, it took me about an hour. If that's too long or too short, just let me know, and we can talk about whatever you guys want. It doesn't matter to me at all. So I think we need to start first by thanking everybody from uh, Virgins Township and the Lowell Historical Museum. For such a small community, um, anybody who hasn't been to the museum here in Lowell, I've, I've been there a couple times and visited, and we're really fortunate. It's really amazing in such a small farming community to have such wonderful people like these that are, uh, are looking after us and taking care of things. So they're really the ones to thank for all this. I'm happy to give my time and stand up here and uh, share a few sea stories with you tonight but all the thanks really goes to them. They're, they're really a fantastic group of people. Yeah, absolutely. So however you wanna do it, Chantel, if you can go to the next slide there. Okay, so how to become a sailor? Well, my own personal story, um, I really need to thank my parents who are here in attendance. Uh, they they kind of set me along this path a long time ago. Um, we'll have to keep it PG because my mom is listening. So, um, lots of family vacations up to Sault Ste. Marie to watch the boats go through the Sioux Locks. A um, couple trips across uh, Lake Michigan on the Carfrey Badger. One in particular still stands out to me. I don't know how my dad figured this one out, but they had a, uh, a young female third mate on board that somehow in his social butterfly uh, figured, you know, met this lady and convinced her to come and talk to me for a few minutes. And, uh, gave me a tour of the boat and everything. So um, really a lot of uh, family trips to start out with. Uh, in sixth grade, um, I went. I was going through Grand Rapids Public Schools, John Ball Zoo School, and we had a couple uh, teachers there. One of them was still living back in the 60s and 70s, reliving his hippie days back then, and uh, had a guitar and liked to sing and have the entire class sing, and first heard The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald by Gordon Lightfoot. So. For all of you back in those days, uh, pre-Google and cell phones and all that. So what do you do? Well, you convince your mom to take you to the library and find a book about the Edmund Fitzgerald and read up on it. And um, learned a little bit about the ship and the industry. And one of the young men who was on board and lost his life that night happened to be a cadet at Great Lakes Maritime Academy. So start doing a little bit of research. What's Great Lakes Maritime Academy? It's in Traverse City. Um, Somehow, again, they set up a recruiting visit. I think it was sophomore, freshman year. I don't remember. They thought that I was ready to sign up and start right then. So uh, a couple of years later, out of high school, go up to Great Lakes Maritime Academy. Um, at the time, it was a, uh, a three-year school. So graduated with an associate's degree. But what was more important then is that they trained all the officer corps for the Great Lakes ships. So whether you're going through the deck department and uh, becoming a mate, and then eventually a captain, or through the engineering department, you graduated with either a mate's license or a third assistant engineer's license. And what I didn't really understand at the time, but became very important throughout my career, is the deck program of the six or seven maritime academies in the United States, it's the only one where their mate graduates come out with a pilotage endorsement on their license. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But as far as sailing on the Great Lakes in, in a uh, deck officer capacity, that's really important. Um, so graduated from Great Lakes Maritime in 1999. Part of the curriculum there at the school is you spend 270 days throughout your, your three-year program there. It's four years now, three years when I was going through there. So you spend these 270 days at different periods through your, your um, time at the academy on commercial ships. Now, today, the program's changed a little bit. They do a lot more with the ocean-going ships as well. When I went through there, the focus was completely on the Great Lakes. So um, spent a little bit of time on uh, the Roger Blau, a couple weeks over Christmas one year on the Gott. I sailed with uh, Ogle Bay Norton on the Courtney Burton for one summer and did some time with American Steamship also. So graduating from Great Lakes Maritime Academy, Everybody had terrible experiences with Great Lakes Fleet. 
So we're all coming out of there and everybody wanted to work for either Old Bay Norton or American Steamship Company. Nobody wants to work for Great Lakes Fleet. So the, the industry is all unionized, have to join the union. So we all graduate, go down to the union hall in Toledo, sign up. And the first phone call I get, Great Lakes Fleet. So 60 days on the Munson, the, the, uh, the magic number is 60 days. You have to sail 60 days consecutively when you first start out to get on with the company's seniority list. So 60 days on the Munson, it was a little bit of a down year. A couple of the fleet's boats laid up, but I got just enough time to get on the seniority list with Great Lakes Fleet. So uh, a couple of the boats laid up, somebody with more seniority comes, bumps me off. I go home, call the union back right away. Okay, I'm ready to go back to work. Couple weeks later, next phone call, Gray Lakes Fleet. So, spent the next year and a half on the Presque Isle, and uh, the rest is history. Um, the company went through some uh, some changes during that period. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, but I ended up um, the captain that was on the Presque Isle for that that year and a half that I was there was not what you would um, describe as the most personable individual. My longest conversation with him was probably, other than getting screamed at all the time, um, was probably about two or three sentences. Um, extremely confident guy, just was not a very talkative individual. So when the ship laid up at the end of that second year, the company was selling off a couple of our smaller boats. And being one of the newer hires, being fairly low on our seniority list, I pretty much knew my job was going along with them. Unknown to me, this uh, this rather grumpy captain had wrote a letter to the HR department at the company and said, Tim's doing a pretty good job. We need to find a way to keep him around. So uh, I'd been home for a couple weeks during that winter and got a phone call from our HR department. And there's two main officers unions on the Great Lakes. Mer American Maritime Officers, AMO is the big one. And that's who I originally joined up with. Um, MMP has a much smaller group, um, has a couple boats with Great Lakes Fleet, and they basically offered me a job with them. So I talked over with my dad for a little bit and thought it over, and sure, sounds like a great job. And I've been there ever since. So that was 2001. I spent the next uh, five or six years on the GOT. Spent a couple of years on the Roger Blau, a little bit of time on the Spear in between here and there. Uh, 2011, um, through some changes in the company, the captain's job on the GOT became available, and they offered it to me, and I've been there ever since. So. And that's, yeah, that's all I have. So, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, typical crew on a Great Lakes freighter, 12 to 25. On the GOT, we have 20. Um, typical crew. It's um, designated by the Coast Guard, they look at not necessarily the size of the ship, but what kind of ship it is. So a lot of times what you see are these tug barge units, which have kind of came into favor and they're now falling out a little bit. Those, those have been the majority of the new builds the last 10 to 15 years, um, typically have a much smaller crew. And that's just by the way that the Coast Guard views them, because they see it as a tug and an un unmanned barge, even though they're basically the same size. So they tend to get away with the smaller crew, 12 to 15 um, in that area. Um, all, all the ships, three different departments, deck, engine, and galley, the deck side, that's for the, the typical cargo operations, the day-to-day -day operation of the ship, the engine rooms, maintaining the engines and all the equipment on board, and then the galleys cooking our meals for us. Um, when you talk about the different kinds of ships you're going to see on the lakes, the cruise industry has never been as big on the lakes as it has been on the oceans. Um, Pre-COVID, we saw a little bit of an uptick in that, and then, of course, COVID wiped that out completely. And now last year, we saw that return in a rather significant form, and from everything that we're hearing, that's going to continue to increase. Um, and then you see the smaller ferry boats. Um, you know, uh, in the St. Mary's River, going to Drummond Island or Nebish Island. Of course, you have the car ferries, the Badger, and uh, the Lake Express out of Muskegon. And then when you start talking about the commercial ships, uh, two basic kinds, the self-unloaders or straight deck or what they call gearless bulk carriers. And these are the vast majority of the ships on the lakes um, transporting primarily iron ore, coal, and stone. Um, 
size-wise between the U.S. and the Canadian fleets, the Canadians are significantly larger than we are. Um, they have invested tremendously the last couple of years in renewing their ships. They have a lot of new builds that are coming in, all foreign built, you know, either uh, um, Eastern European or Southeast Asia. They're coming from the shipyards over there. And the U.S., one of our competitors, Interlake, we saw the first new build last year, the Mark Barker came out. And then, of course, we see the saltwater visitors that come over. You can change it, Chantel. <clears throat> so the, uh, the chart here is actually from around World War II, but the trade patterns are pretty much the same. Um, the three primary cargoes on the Great Lakes, um, iron ore, coal, and stone, uh, still the, the vast majority of the bulk cargoes that are carried. Um, and typically from the, the western end of Lake Superior down to the steel mills, southern Lake Michigan, Lake Erie. There is a little bit of overseas traffic where they're, they're carrying that um, out through the seaway, but primarily stays here on the Great Lakes. You have a little bit of tanker traffic, um, more so on the eastern side of, uh, of Michigan, Detroit, St. Clair area, and then Lake Erie. Um, the, all the statistics up there are from Lake Carriage Association, and that's that's all up to date. You can go ahead, Chantel. I'll try I'll try some of the um, some of the more historical stuff. That's a little bit boring. I'll try to skip over that. But if you guys have any questions, I'll I will definitely answer it um, as best as I can there. So the Sioux locks. Why are they so important? Um, currently, four chambers at the Sioux. Only two are active, MacArthur, which was built in World War II, and the Pollock, which about 70% of the traffic that operates on the Great Lakes has to use the Pollock. The other two, the Twin Locks, were built in World War I, the Davis and the Sabin. The Sabin was decommissioned in the 1980s, I believe, and the Davis about 25, 30 years ago. So the Army Corps' plan right now, for anybody who's been following along, of course, is to remove the two decommissioned locks, the Davis and the Sabin, and replace them with a single chamber the same size as the pole lock. So this started all the way back in Obama's stimulus package. If you think back to however many years ago that was when uh, they first started appropriating the money for that. And then the project kind of stopped and um, now it's come back much more significantly now. So from what I know, um, the first two phases, the deepening of the channels was completed a couple years ago. And you have to think, you have to remember that all of the concrete that's there, all the structure that's there, it's over 100 years old. And the ships are three to four times the size. So none of that infrastructure is going to support the operations today. So all of that concrete has to be reinforced. All the approach walls were rebuilt this past year. And supposedly um, this summer, the, the final phase of actually constructing the new lock chamber will begin. So anywhere from, they're saying anywhere from six to eight years. And uh, it's just a matter of making sure that the funds continue to be appropriated and um, the interest remains there. So if you, a longer, longer version of the story, if you go back into the 1980s when they first started looking at this and everybody realized how critical the Pollock in particular was to the industry and the Army Corps of Engineers did a cost benefit study and um, came back and said, well, essentially, if the Pollock's taken out of service for any significant amount of time, it will basically immediately put the entire country into a recession. So the assumption back then was that other forms of transportation could pick up the slack if the bolts were not running, railroads and trucking. And they basically ran with this up until the mid to late 1990s. And re-evaluated this cost-benefit study and said, well, this just doesn't seem to make sense. The numbers don't really seem to add up. So they went to the railroads and said, well, this is what we've always assumed. This is what we've always planned. And the railroad said, absolutely, we can most definitely pick up all, the, all that extra business and all that slack. Uh, we'll start building more tracks. We'll order new locomotives. We'll order more cars. Fantastic. No problem. Especially if all of you guys and your taxpayer money is going to cover that. And the Army Corps asked them, said, okay, well, how much money do you need? Oh, about eight to $10 billion. And this, of course, is back in 1995. Um, so 
$1 billion to build a new Sioux Lock, $10 billion to fund a railroad investment project that'll never come to good use. Um, so it's pretty, pretty easy to uh, make that decision. Now, for whatever reason, the Army Corps broadcast this $1 billion figure for a long time and then came back a couple of years ago and said, well, we're well into the project. The cost is now closer to $3 billion. Um, I haven't heard a real good explanation why. I know that inflation, I know that the current worker situation in the economy plays a role in that. Um, but knock on wood, um, everybody in Congress seems to be on the same page. If you can believe that, and they actually agree on something, um, more or less. So the project, as of right now, is still well underway, fully funded, and uh, hopefully within the next 10 years, there will be another post-sized chamber at the locks. So a little bit about Great Lakes Fleet. Um, it was formed uh, in 1901. Um, by United States Steel. So if you think back to your history lessons, early 1900s, um, in the steel industry, United States Steel was the big player. And everything about U.S. Steel was they wanted to control their entire supply chain. They owned the mines, they owned the mineral rights, they owned the land, they owned the docks up in uh, Minnesota. They owned, wanted to own the shipping companies, they owned the railroads. They wanted to control it all. So they basically started buying up these smaller shipping companies formed one great big one. It was called Pittsburgh Steamship Division for a number of years. They um, absorbed the Bradley Line, which was a smaller fleet um, home ported out of Roger City that carried most of the limestone and the aggregates. But everything was designed around transporting the cargoes that U.S. Steel needed to supply their steel mills to produce their steel products. Okay, you can go on there, Chantel. They were always kind of known as uh, as the trendsetters. You know, they were the biggest fleet on the Great Lakes. Um, you know, the the stories of the U.S. steel boat, you know, going down Lake Michigan and almost running over another boat because they refused to change course, and the captain saying, "Well, we work for U.S. Steel; it's our lake." You know, those those are still well known. We don't really follow those rules anymore but uh um for some of the old timers it's yeah that that reputation is still out there a little bit but u.s steel was always kind of known as the big player on the great lakes they were always the ones that built the next generation of ship that that uh, built the next bigger ship um, they were instrumental when the thousand foot when the super carriers were were being designed of working with the corps of engineers making sure that the rivers were sufficiently dredged out that when the Pollock was being constructed and designed that it was going to be built to a significant size to support the ships. Um, so they were always kind of the big player on the Great Lakes. Now, if you think back to the late 1970s, early 1980s, a couple big things were happening in the steel industry at that time. The biggest one was foreign competition. So after World War II, Obviously, the United States is the only economy that survived. So all these other countries basically had to rebuild all of their infrastructure. Well, they built new technology, more efficient, more capable steel mills. The United States was still operating the same ones that we had from 1910 to 1920. So eventually, it starts to catch up with the steel industry. They can't compete anymore. So all of these foreign entities are now putting the domestic steel industry out of business. So anybody who wasn't quite all the smaller players, some of the bigger players that couldn't quite compete and keep up started to go out of business. At the same time, these thousand foot supercarriers start showing up. So when you take a thousand footer like the GOT and you look back to some of the ships that were running in the 60s and 70s, we could replace anywhere from three to six of them. So a fleet like US Steel that was running 50 or 60 ships in the 60s now all of a sudden could retire 50% of their fleet and still have the same cargo carrying capacity. And at the same time, the industry is falling apart, so now they have all this excess capacity as well. So you see this, this huge shrinking of the steel industry and the Great Lakes shipping industry all at the same time. So um, into, yeah, I refer to my notes here real quick. Um, U.S. Steel starts to look at divesting themselves of some of these transportation 
entities that they have. And so they formed this company called Transtar. And Transtar basically takes all of the transportation industries from the U.S. Steel, the docks, the ships, the railroads, spins it off into its own separate company, still owned and managed by U.S. Steel, but no longer really part of the parent company itself. So that happens in 1998. Come uh, 2001, this investment group called Blackstone out of uh, Philadelphia or New York, I believe, comes on scene and approaches Transtar and offers to buy all of the, the uh, transportation assets there. So they sell them off. Well, now this is not a transportation. It's not a, a company that's looking to stay in. It's, it's an investment group. They came in and said, we're here for five years. We're going to get what we can out of the boats out of the railroads, out of the docks. We have no intention of sticking around long-term. And they did exactly that. Not exactly our brightest days. No investment into repairs, no investment into crew comfort, no investment into new technology. Um, basically just running the boats for what they could. And part of what I was talking about before was selling off some of the older assets and some of our jobs along with them. So that lasts for a couple of years. And then in 2004, CN comes on the scene. CN, this is CN Railroad out of Montreal, Canada. And through some acquisitions and abandonments and mergers, they basically had built a rail network from just north of Minnesota on the Canadian border all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, except for one little tiny stretch of track in between two harbors and Duluth, Minnesota, which was owned by DM&IR Railroad, which is owned by Transtar. So CN goes to Transtar and says, hey, we want to buy this little stretch of about 40 miles of track to complete our rail network. And Transtar says, fantastic. You got the money. It's yours. But you have to take the boats and the docks along with it. And CN, not really understanding what exactly they were getting into, absolutely, because all they had in mind was that one little stretch of railroad. So now comes into play this neat little thing called the Jones Act. And if anybody hasn't heard of that, it's an old cabbage law in the United States that says that any ship that carries cargo between two domestic ports in the United States has to be built in the United States, has to be crewed by United States sailors, and has to be managed or owned by a United States company. CN being from Canada cannot operate Great Lakes Fleet. So they go to Keystone Transportation which if you read my little flyer there, is an old, old family-owned shipping company out of Philadelphia, and they now manage Great Lakes Fleet for us. So, all right, now we can start talking about the fun stuff. So here's, here's my ship, the Edwin H. Gott, 1,004 feet long, 105 feet wide. Um, she was built in, uh, main voyage was in 1979. And at that time, I think this is still true, it was either the earliest or the latest maiden voyage of a Great Lakes freighter, or however you want to look at it. So she was built in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, um, went to Milwaukee to complete fitting out, and then was supposed to transit from Milwaukee to Two Harbors, Minnesota to pick up her first load in February. Now, for everybody that remembers, 1978 in February, my mom's smiling um, because that was the year I was born and I've heard all the wonderful stories about it, uh, was a little bit of a rough time from what I understand. At this time, U.S. Steel was working with the Coast Guard um, trying to determine the feasibility of year-round navigation on the Great Lakes, which had never been done before. So the Coast Guard cutter Mackinac, the old Mackinac, the original one, picked up the god outside Milwaukee, escorted her up Lake Michigan, up through the St. Mary's River, all the way across Lake Superior, finally got to two harbors, um, made the dock, and found out that they punched a hole in the bow, that they damaged one of her propellers, and they lost a rudder working on their way across Lake Superior and all the ice. So she sat there for three or four weeks, getting put back together and repaired. And uh, I think they tried winter navigation one or two more years, and basically found out that Mother Nature is a little more powerful than the U.S. Coast Guard. So um, they set specific dates, opening and closing the Sioux locks. January 15th, they close. March uh, 25th, they open. 
And it basically takes an act of Congress to change that. It's happened once in my career where they extended shipping an extra two weeks. Um, it lasted for about three or four days and uh, um, it didn't go well. We'll just, we'll leave it at that. The, um, the winter set in very quickly and uh, pretty much shut us all down. So January 15th, March 25th, opening and closing dates. Um, a little bit more about the boat. Uh, because she was built by U.S. Steel to carry U.S. Steel products, she was only designed to carry iron ore. Technically, we can carry coal and stone. Um, it's never happened before. She's only carried iron ore. In relation to other ships of our size, we have very, very small cargo holds because iron ore is its a much more dense product. So it takes a lot less product um, to reach the same cargo tonnage as it would with a stone or a coal load. So when you look at a lot of the other thousand footers, they have much larger cargo holds, um, much smaller ballast capacity compared to us because they're a little bit more versatile. They, they can carry some other cargos that we can. Because of that too, because she was only designed for the iron ore trade, U.S. Steel at their two primary docks in Gary and Kania, they have a hopper system there. So you don't need the traditional long deck boom that you see on most of the Great Lakes freighters. So originally, and the Spear still has hers, they just had a little short shuttle boom that extends out over the side about 50 feet, dumps into a hopper. The hopper system can go and put it wherever they want on the dock. In 1996, now if you remember back to what I was talking about, Transtar, this is towards the end of Transtar, but they still own the boats and U.S. Steel's still intimately involved in that. U.S. Steel's big mill in Gary went through some, some design changes. And if you ever look at Google Maps and look at Gary, the harbor is a long, it's a mile long, due north and south slip. And their two primary storage areas are at the very north end and the very south end of the dock. Well, their hopper system could no longer service those areas. So they needed a boat with a boom longer than all the other ships on the Great Lakes. Traditionally, the booms on the Great Lakes are around 250, 260 feet long. Ours is 280 feet long. It was specifically designed by U.S. Steel and by Great Lakes Fleet to service that particular dock in those two areas. So we can hit areas that no other boat on the Great Lakes can, can service. Uh, originally, she was built with uh, two V16 Enterprise diesel engines. At the time, and she still is, most powerful commercial ship that's ever sailed the Great Lakes. The original engines were about 9,500 horsepower each. Um, into starting in the early 2000s, getting into 2005, 2006, the engines just weren't supportable anymore. They couldn't get parts for them. Um, difficult to find people that were familiar with that style of engine to work on them. So the company basically had to make a decision. If they wanted the ship to be viable um, going into the future, they had to do something. The, the original power plant was no longer an option. So November of 2010, she goes back to Sturgeon Bay. They tear out the original Enterprise diesels and replace them with two German-built MAK uh, inline eight diesel engines, 9750 horsepower each. We typically run them around 90, 92%. But the nice part of that is, is that I can still bring the phone call down to the engine room. Chief engineer will give me the extra little bit of gas and, and away we go if, if we ever need the extra horsepower. So this picture, this is uh, after we completed a load that's two harbors, Minnesota, if uh, you haven't been there before. Um, we're, we've completed our load, we're back and away from the dock. Just as these ships were being designed and built in the, uh, in the early to mid 1970s, U.S. Steel also rebuilt the dock here in Two Harbors and the one in Duluth. So they're designed specifically for the Gaunt and the Spear. So if you look at our ships compared to a lot of the other thousand footers, we have very small hatch covers and only about half as many as the other thousand footers. Um, the docks here, match up, there's one loading rig for each one of our hatches there. So basically when we pull in, um, in the picture there, those arms come down, the conveyor belt runs out onto them, and that's how they, they load the cargo into the ship. What um, we, we had, one of our old traffic managers, his favorite term was velocity, which I put it on there. I guess it's kind of an inside joke, but what they, always, what they always talk about with us, what kind of sets us apart, 
since we are dedicated to the iron ore trade, we really can't compete with anybody else when it comes to other cargoes. But when you talk about the iron ore trade, there's nobody else that can compete with us. So we've got the longer boom. So while that's specifically designed for Gary Works, um, we can go to any other port that's large enough to accommodate the ship. We've gone to places before and I've talked to some of the dock managers and they're like, wow, we've never seen cargo over there before because we've never had a boat with a boom here length before. Um, so we, uh, we typically load faster than everybody else because the docks are catered, they're designed specifically for our boats. We're faster out on the open lake. We get to the unload dock, we can put the cargo where nobody else can, we can unload faster than anybody else can, and then we turn around and we beat everybody right back up to the loading dock for our next load again. So while we can only do one thing, nobody else can compete with us when it comes to iron ore. You, you can change. Some of the other cool stuff um, that we've gotten to do, all those pictures are um, transfer unloads between either us and other boats. Um, the, the upper left there, that was an export program that we did. Um, we partnered with Canada Steamship Lines. Because of the size of the ship, we can't fit out through the Welland Canal. So Lake Erie's as far as we can go, we can't go out Lake Ontario or out through the Seaway. So U.S. Steel actually sold some taconite pellets. This was five or six years ago, maybe even longer than that. But they sold some taconite pellets to China, and it was cheaper for us to go up to two harbors, load it, and then this was taking place in Conneaut, Ohio. We would go in and tie up. Two or three little Canadian boats would come in. We'd transfer our cargo into them. They'd take it out the seaway, load it onto big uh, ocean-going bulkers, and they'd ship it over to China. So just some different ways that the worldwide economies affect all of us. The one on the top right there, that's um, the Got in the American Spirit. That was, oh, again, I want to say about five or six years ago. Um, American Steamship had some labor relation issues, and one of their um, unions actually went on strike. And it happened just as the American Spirit finished their load in two harbors, and they were going to lay the ship up in Duluth while they tried to figure this this labor issue out, but they were loaded too deep to get into the dock that they wanted to go to. So they anchored off Duluth and us being the nice guys that we are, went and tied up alongside and they transferred, I wanna say about 15 or 18,000 tons into us and went into their layup dock and we went to two harbors and finished off our load and then on our way. And then that bottom picture, that was, that was from early in my career that was another another one of those export programs. Um, in that one, we were anchored behind Long Point. So that's on Lake Erie. It's on the north shore of Lake Erie, just off the Canadian shoreline. And we had two of these smaller Canadian ships. You can kind of see the one where our boom is swung out there off on the right-hand side. And then the second one that we were gonna transfer into came in on the other side and tied up. What This was the first time that we'd done something like this. and. What the captain of that first Canadian ship didn't realize is that he, he had a, a self-unloading boom, too, that he had to swing out of the way. But coming in and tying up the way that he was there, facing the same direction, he couldn't swing his boom out of the way far enough in order to get our boom into some of his hatches. So we could only partially load him. So what we ended up doing later on that night is we swung our boom the other side, and then that... Uh, I can't read the name on that other CSL boat on our port side, swung his boom across our deck, we unloaded into him, he unloaded across us into the other one to finish finish the load out. So um, all, all those neat little things. We don't do that kind of stuff terribly often, but it does happen every now and then. So when we talk about working together, obviously we're one big happy fleet. We all love each other and get along, um, you know, within our, our eight or nine boats. Um, but that doesn't, it, it, it extends to some of our competitors as well. Since we all are part of the same Great Lakes system, there are times when the fleets reach across the aisle and talk to each other and, uh, and help each other out. And then uh, we also talk about our stakeholders. And when I say that, um, we, we mean our own employees, our own personnel, but that includes everybody else, including all of you. That includes all of the people that own property along the rivers, um, anybody who might utilize the Great Lakes. 
I think that we're we're really fortunate here, and we we lose sight a little bit of just what a wonderful resource all of the Great Lakes are to us and how fortunate we are to have them so geographically close. You know, you hear about some of the water wars out in the West between the ranchers and the farmers and water rights. And and uh, um, we're a little bit spoiled in that we don't have to worry about some of that stuff. So with our company, and I wish I could say all of our competitors feel the same way. Um, unfortunately, that's not always the case, but we, we take that very seriously. You know, we, we understand that we're utilizing this resource um, but we're caretakers in that the same way as anybody else is. So when it comes to pollution, water pollution, you know, air pollution, noise pollution, um, certainly uh, oil pollution is, is something we take very seriously. Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's a big part of what we do and, and what we focus on. And one of the really nice things that I got to experience in my career was that transition from Blackstone to CN and Keystone. Um, and it's it's really to attribute to Keystone more than anybody. Um, you know, you, you talk about going from an, working for an investment firm that really has no long term goals other than just to suck out what they can from the company, and you, you witness that happening, and then you see a company like CN and Keystone come in, and uh, we're not perfect. We we have our problems like everybody else does, but being Keystone in particular, being that old family-run shipping company, um, they focus on safety and the environment and doing our best to do things the right way. And it, it doesn't always happen. We make our mistakes and we, you know, we have our failures just like everybody else. Um, but the effort is definitely there. And it's nice to see that from your parent company, that they, they stand there and they stand behind it. And everybody says safety first. Everybody says that's important. It's nice to see it come right down from the top that uh, um, that means more than saving five or 10 minutes. It's, it's more important to them that everything's done properly, that the effort is made and everybody's safe at the end of the day. And then of course, um, you know, we, we work a lot with the government too, the Coast Guards. Um, there are uh, inspecting agency, them and the American Bureau of Shipping. Um, so we work closely with them. It's traditionally a pretty good relationship. Um, you know, they, they have the same kind of crewing and HR problems that everybody else has. But a lot of the times, uh, um, you know, they're, they're professionals just like we are. And uh, it's, it's a professional working relationship. And uh, more often than not, it goes better than you would think that it would. This, uh, this is my, uh, my good friend, Johnny Rice. Um, he's, he's one of our senior wheelsmen on board the ship. And um, if any of you are on Facebook, he's actually a, a really good photographer. He takes and posts a lot of pictures online. Um, this was in uh, January of last year, of 2022. It was our last trip of the season. We'd unloaded in Gary. We were supposed to lay up in Toledo, Ohio. So we were transiting up Lake Michigan. Um, this was mid January, you know, 15th, 18th of January, sometime in that neighborhood. Um, the high for the day, I want to say, was around minus five or so. It was a, a nice big westerly storm. And in the process of finishing up the unload and going to the layup dock, you know, we're rinsing the boat down, trying to get everything cleaned up and put away. And our deck line that we used to clean the deck up actually froze solid. So we were all out there. 10 o'clock at night, um, yeah, trying to trying to thaw the line out, and the water was spraying out as fast as we could get it thawed out and then refreezing again. So, you know, if you can envision, you know, 10 guys out there in rain gear and, and heavy gear and then uh, getting basically frozen as you're trying to work at the same time. So um, John was nice enough to provide us a, a little memento of that wonderful time of year there. So um, typical crew on board, like I said, 20 of us, three departments, the captain, three mates, um, bosun, deckhand, six ABs make up the deck department. So I talked a little bit about uh, pilotage endorsement. What does that mean? So the Great Lakes are all designated waters. So every ship, every commercial ship has to have a pilot on board. All of our ships, all the commercial ships, the captain and all three mates are pilots. 
any of the foreign ships that come in, they have to take a pilot on board. So all the way through the St. Lawrence CUA, Lake Ontario, Welland Canal, all wherever they go on the Great Lakes, they have to have a pilot on board. We do our own piloting. Captain and the mates are, are all our own pilots. And that's really what sets Great Lakes Maritime Academy apart from the rest of the academies is they focus specifically on the Great Lakes and it's changed a little bit in the 20 some years since I was there, but they, they still come out with that pilotage endorsement on their license. Um, engine room is the chief engineer, three assistant engineers, conveyor men and the handyman. They keep the engines running, keep the generators running, the lights on, um, do all the maintenance on board. If it's something major, we have some outside, we might call in an outside expert to come in if it's a major engine problem or a specific issue that's beyond their expertise. But the majority of the maintenance work is done internally. Um, and then we have two cooks on board, a steward and a second cook. I'm fortunate that our, our cook, and I have to brag a little bit, it's probably the, the best one that I've ever sailed with. No, nobody's losing any weight when they're on board. My, my son, I had to take my son to the doctor the other day, and uh, he had to get on the scale to get weighed. And uh, he he was te he's only three three years old. Sorry, I'd look at look at grandma there. He was teasing me for being too fat that I wasn't going to fit in my uniform today. So I got the last lap. It still fits. Um, but yeah, really super good cook on board. Um, even the ones that aren't that great, we still eat pretty good. So there there's not a whole lot of people that that uh, lose weight on the boat. But um, pretty much everything is done internally with the crew. All the docks that we make, we rarely use tugboats. Um, anytime that you're watching the ships make a dock, you always see the crew going over on the bosun's chair and get landed down. That's all of our own guys that go down on the dock and handle our mooring cables. Um, all of the internal maintenance, all of that, taking on all our supplies, all the cargo operations. We pretty much do all of that internally. So as far as uh, cargo operations, I talked a little bit about the loading. Now with the unloading, it's, um, it's a little hard to envision, but all the way underneath the ship, all the way underneath the cargo hold, there's a conveyor belt. Just on top of that conveyor belt, there's a series of 72 gates. They're run by air. So when we get to the unload dock, um, swing the boom out. The picture on the far right, we're actually in Gary, Indiana. We're unloading into their hopper system there. And we, once we're tied up and secured, two of our crew members go down into the unloading tunnel and they're physically opening and closing those gates. Now the ship's so long that she'll actually flex and bend throughout this whole process. So it has to be, it's a preset arrangement. They run open and close so many gates in different sequences. And then at the same time, that picture in the middle is our ballast system. There's a mate in the pilot house that's monitoring the rate that we're unloading at, and he's calling down and telling the people in the tunnel, close your gates a little bit, we're too fast, open your gates up a little bit more, we need to give them some more. And at the same time, as they're unloading, we're pumping in ballast to kind of counteract that, that transfer of weight. So you can actually, because of the length of the ship and the way they're designed, they're designed to flex and bend a certain amount but if you don't do it in the correct sequence at the correct time, you can actually cause structural damage to the, the hull of the ship itself. And there's all these fancy words that marine engineers use, you know, deflection of the hull girder and all this, you know, college nonsense, you know, people that have never actually set foot on a boat before. Um, but that's, that's the general idea, is that you're trying to keep the ship from flexing and bending too much right there. And then the, the picture on the far left there, that's the, the controls for all the belts. That's, that's all up in the pilot house. Us and the Spear are a little bit unique in that um, because they were designed just to unload into a hopper system, there's always a mate up in the pilot house. That's where we control everything from. Most other boats, a lot of this, especially the ballasting process, would take place down in the engine room and the mate would be out on deck. But because we're, we're a little bit unique, we, we kind of control everything from up in the pilot house there. So when you're talking about actually driving the boat, um, one of, uh, one of the, uh, the first captains that I worked with, that's, that's basically how he, he summed it up, his job up, is he said, well, you just point the boat at the dock and you don't actually run into anything. So might be a little bit of a uh, um, 
trying to uh, uh, simplify things there a little bit. But that's that's the general idea, actually. So um, we have a lot of equipment. The, the picture on the left there, those that's one of the throttle stations. Um, the ship, like I said, it has two engines. They're independently controlled. Each one has a propeller and a rudder uh, behind it. So I can control each each engine independently. I can control the rudders at the same time. We have a 1,500 horsepower bow thruster. And then uh, the picture on the right, we have an electronic charting system that's tied in with our GPS. So you can see where the ship is um, at all times from an overhead perspective. And then it, it shows everything else, um, the ship speed, what the wind is. Um, so we have a, a lot of technology today that they didn't have just 10 or 15 years ago. And then there's, there's all of the other traditional things. Uh, we have three radars that you use for navigation as well as collision avoidance. Um, the AIS that everybody loves on marine traffic, that everybody knows exactly where we're at now. So we watch that too to see where all of our competitors are at. Um, so there's there's all of that wonderful technology now. So I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about horsepower. You know, we we talk the boat up so much. You know, she's got these big engines and she's so fast, so powerful. On the Great Lakes, yes. Um, the maritime community as a whole, uh, not really, no. Um, you, when you start looking back through history or even at some of the ships today, um, you know, some of the large naval ships, the nuclear-powered aircraft carriers, you're, you're rating their horsepower in the hundreds of thousands. Um, same thing, you know, with the World War II battleships. The ocean-going ships, you know, some of these big container ships, these Maersk Line container ships, um, run up in around 100,000 horsepower, but it's a different kind of route that they're going across. Our, our typical trading pattern, about three days to get from our loading dock to our unloading dock. Um, something like that, that Maersk container ship that might travel across the Pacific Ocean, well, that extra, you know, uh, uh, five or ten knots that they can make with all that extra horsepower, it makes a big difference. It might make, instead of a three-week trip, now they might be talking, you know, a two-week trip or an 18-day trip. So um, it's it's a significant difference for them. Real quick about a uh, real quick lesson about horsepower: the the relationship between horsepower and speed it's an exponential curve. And what that means is that to get every additional knot of speed, it means an additional increase in horsepower. So. A real quick example, the, the picture at the top, that's the most powerful commercial ship in the history of, of the Merchant Marine. That's the, the uh, liner, the SS United States, 248,000 horsepower. Her typical cruising speed on a North Atlantic crossing was 30 knots. She could do that at 50% horsepower. Her absolute maximum speed was just under 36 knots. So to get that extra six knots of speed, it took another 120,000 horsepower. So it's it's a significant increase in fuel and um, and and engine power in order to get those those incremental increases in speed. So weather is obviously a a, uh, a huge part of our. Uh, of our job. Um, anytime that you talk about that and you're looking at the Great Lakes, each lake is different. Each port is going to be different. So it, it depends a lot on the geographical nature. So you take Lake Superior, for instance, a north or a south storm on Lake Superior isn't that big of a deal. You have a lot of north wind, well, you just follow the north shore. A lot of south wind, you follow the south shore, and then you stay out of the worst of the weather. You go down on Lake Michigan, which is Reference completely the opposite. It's a north-south lake. If you have a north-south wind on Lake Michigan, it's a whole different ball game to deal with. There, there's nowhere to go and hide. So um, each lake is its own entity that you're watching the weather forecasting on. Each port is. Whereas Gary is a north-south dock that you make there. So a north or a south wind in Gary affects you completely differently than two harbors, which is more of a of a sheltered only a southerly wind affects you there. So regardless of where we go, the weather's always a big issue for us, something that you're always watching. And a big part of the job that you learn through experience watching 
some of the mistakes other people's make, making mistakes yourself or putting the boat in the wrong position for the wrong weather. Um, you kind of learn where to hide, where to, you know, when to wait, when to try to make a, make a dock. You, you kind of learn what, um, what the ship can handle and overcome and also what your own skills are. So there, there's a lot involved there. The last U.S. flag commercial ship that was lost was the, the El Faro in 2006. And it, it was within the industry. It was a pretty big deal. It was it, it garnered a little bit of national attention, but not a whole lot. Um, but after that, NOAA in particular recognized some failures in the way that they, the models that they use and how they forecast the weather and how they get those weather forecasts out to the Mariner community. So we get a lot of now um, emails, just random emails that'll pop up from, from a NOAA meteorologist in Detroit saying, you know, I'm looking three or four days into the future, and it looks like we're going to have a storm on Lake Huron. And then they'll continue to update us through the week as to how, how their forecasts and how their models change. Windy TV is a fantastic resource. We watch that all the time. If, uh, if anybody wants to know what the wind forecast is going to be, I highly recommend it. They actually do a really good job. And then all of the commercial ships, we report our weather, too. Uh, that all goes into NOAA and they use that to develop some of their forecasting models. So I have a, uh, a quick video here. We'll see if Chantel can get, I'll let the sound there. This was, um, two, yeah, Eight on the Roger Blau going across Lake Superior. Main deck of the Roger Blau, November 27, 2007, 1300. So not, obviously not a, uh, a beautiful summer day, but it really, from what I remember, wasn't, I mean, it's not, it's the last storm video, Mom, I promise. Um, but uh, yeah, it's not, not, nothing, nothing terribly unusual, actually, from, from what we encounter in, uh, throughout the year, but definitely in November, December, and, and again in the spring. You can go to the next one there, Chantel. This is uh, 2015 Lake Superior off uh, Whitefish Point. That's the Cutter Mackinac trying to break us a relief track in the ice.
so what uh, the, the whole story behind it, this was the first trip of the year. Um, we locked through and then the Roger Blaud locked through behind us. And it was just the two of us. You can see kind of on the horizon there behind the Mackinac was the John G. Munson. And they were working with a, another cutter trying to get come downbound. And um, what had happened is there was a fairly significant northwest storm on Lake Superior. And it basically packed all of the ice right around Whitefish Point. And there was so much pressure on it that we couldn't push through it. So the Mackinac try they they gave it their best effort from what i remember for two days i think and they finally suffered a some kind of a propulsion casualty and then they had to turn around and go back to the sioux and left us in the blau on our own and eventually the wind shifted around and relieved some of the pressure on the ice and and we were able to take off and uh the blau actually left during the night um and got out in front of us and then got off the keweenaw peninsula and got stuck and we had to go and, and be in the bigger, more powerful ship, we were able to go and break them free. Um, but uh, typically um, out, on, out on the open lake, we have enough horsepower. We, the, the ship is designed for these kinds of conditions. U.S. Steel looked ahead. They, they built the ships, they built their ships to handle these kinds of conditions. So while we're not actually designated an icebreaker, the ship's pretty pretty stoutly built. We have a lot of extra steel, a lot of horsepower, and uh, typically um, once we get up and running out on the open lake, we don't have a lot of problems unless we run into a situation like this. So, I have a couple more a little bit later on if you want to go to the next one there. This picture was, um, this was this previous March in uh, uh, 2022. That's the Edgar B. Spear behind us. They, it was the first trip of the year. They went up and locked through first. They got the honors. We locked through right after them. Um, they had a little bit more trouble in the ice going across Lake Superior. We were faster than they are. We got in front, loaded first, came down. So this is actually us coming back downbound, and we were in front. Um, they were following behind us, and the Mackinac came out and, uh, and picked us up. And this, this was the morning that the Mackinac got us off Whitefish Point, and they're trying to escort us down to the... Uh, down to the St. Mary's River. The problem that we have working on the ice is maneuvering. So you can kind of see in that picture, we're going in a fairly straight line, leaving that nice track back behind us where the spear is kind of cockeyed there. They're a little bit sideways. And what happens is you get into the ice and the ship, you basically can't steer the ship. It's going to find the path of least resistance. And that's what happened is they got a little bit out of our track and got into a little bit of a fissure there where the ice separated and instead of going straight, they just kind of took off at an angle. Um, the icebreakers, the best way that I could describe it is like trying to shove a cork into a bottle. When you talk about these icebreakers, even the bigger ones, like the Mackinac, 60 foot beam, well, we're 105. So they go through and they break a nice 60 foot wide track and they don't exactly steer a straight course. They kind of bounce around into the softer parts of the ice too. And then we come along behind them and basically have to force our way through that track that they left for us um, and, and kind of find our own way there. So it's um, ice breaking is all about horsepower. It's all about the design of the ship. Um, when you get into the really serious winters, like we saw, 10 or 12 years ago, then you're talking about when the entire lake is frozen over and you're trying to, you're using satellite pictures to try to find what's going to be your best path to take across there. River piloting is where we really have our biggest problems. And that's because you're, you're turning the ship in confined channels in very short distances. You're making significant turns and uh, all the horsepower in the world and all the rudder angle in the world, if the ice is too thick, the ship's not going to turn. So it's, uh, it's a matter of letting icebreakers go in front of us and try to cut the turn out enough, enough for us, trying to explain to the commanding officer over there who's driving around a 140-foot icebreaking tug that my 1,000-foot ship doesn't turn like his little tiny tugboat does, um, and I need a little bit more room. And then when we get into the harbors, we, we typically use a lot of commercial tugs to break up the ice and, uh, and to help us out making the docks. So this one, uh, this video is downbound. Um, 
Whitefish Bay, I think it was 2015. And you can kind of see the track that the icebreaker left. It curves off to the left there in front of us. And it's hard to tell, but you'll actually see the boat. We're, we're not even steering. The boat just kind of pinballs, just bounces off the sides of the track as we go. So I've never been in, in an earthquake before, but that's about what I would imagine that it, that it would be. So um, if operating, navigating in the ice, it's fun for about the first hour or two. And then your ears are ringing and you have a headache and you cannot talk. It's, you, we can't stand here and have a conversation because you can't hear what's going on. It, it was kind of hard to hear there in the video, but everything is shaking as violently as it possibly can. We've broken more coffee pots than I can even keep track of. Pictures falling off the walls, computer desks tipping over. I mean, anything that isn't securely fastened down has either fallen over once upon a time or is tied to a wall or something to keep it from moving. Um, it's about as uncomfortable a situation as, as I've experienced before. So, I mean, if, if you imagine you're sitting on top of 20,000 horsepower that's pushing for every bit that it possibly has to move that ship. And you might be making five or six knots on a good day. Um, so it's, uh, you know, the ship is basically struggling to do whatever it possibly can. Um, but again, when we, you know, we brag up our, our fleet a little bit, that's what that extra horsepower, that's why they purchased the big engines. That's why they designed the boat with all the extra steel in it. While our competitors typically don't even come out um, in these kinds of conditions, or they're the first ones that get stuck, we're traditionally the ones that keep going and are able to fight our way through this. Um, we haven't seen it a lot in the last, you know, the, these bad ice winters, you know, that was 2014, 2015. Everybody remembers what those winters were like. They were pretty brutal. Um, so some of that experience and knowledge and that, that firsthand relationship that we had with all the COs on, on the icebreakers, you know, we've lost a little bit of that in the last, you know, eight, 10 years. Um, but the ships are still there. They're still capable of doing that. So it's not... Um, I can't take too much credit for it. There's not a whole lot of skill involved in taking the throttles and pushing them down as far as they possibly can. And like I said, you're, it's not like you're steering the boat. You basically just sit back and it'll find its own way there. So, and if it doesn't get through, then you stop and you wait for the icebreaker to come and rescue you. This was uh, 2015 Whitefish Bay. That's the uh, Canadian cutter Pierre Radisson. That ice is probably, I don't, I'm just guessing off the top of my head, maybe three or four feet solid thick. And yeah. They, um, they, they pretty much, at that, that one there, they, they were pretty much making a point that they were the biggest, baddest one around. And uh, yeah, he, uh, um, so we, we'd made a complete round trip, us and the Blau. And the, the first time we were the only two boats operating. Well, by the time we got back up through the St. Mary's River, a lot of our competitors had fit their boats out and had come back. And uh, so now we were at the back of the line Right at the end of the video, you can kind of see there's a whole string of boats out in front of us there. We were, I don't know, 12th or 14th in line. 
And uh, when these guys show up, this is one of the Canadians, not not to disparage the American Coast Guard too much, um, but when these guys show up, they mean business. I mean, they, these, these guys spend their, their career up in the Arctic Circle. So four feet of ice in Whitefish Bay, that's, that's like a little summertime cruise for them. I mean, this, this, this is nothing. I mean, when, when they went by there, they were up, they had the radio blaring in the pilot house. They were dancing and waving and not... Yeah, the rest of us are, are frozen solid, and um, yeah. So in, in this case, yeah, he, he just blew right on by us, and uh, it, I don't even think it slowed him down. Um, so we were at the back of the line. The One of the, the smaller Canadian cutters, the Samuel Risley, that typically works on the Great Lakes, he had taken the first four or five ships and was trying to escort them up onto Lake Superior. This guy shows up, and... Uh, calls up the Risley and says, well, I'm going to grab everybody else here and we're going to follow behind you. And the Risley, we were listening in on the radio, listening to their conversation back and forth. And the CO on the Risley said, oh, no, no. He says, don't, don't bring the, the Blau and the God. Leave the last two. It's too many ships. It's too many ships. And the, uh, the CO on the Radisson here, he, he came back and he says, well, why? Is there something wrong? Or are their engines broken? Is there something wrong with them? And the captain on the Blau beat me to it and keyed in on the radio and says, there's absolutely nothing wrong. We're ready to go. And we got them all fired up. And uh, that whole line of ships that you see there, he, he grabbed us all and we all followed him up on the lake. And later that evening, um, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 o'clock midnight or something, the CO on the Risley had had enough. He had his little group of four or five ships, and he decided to call it quits for the night. He pulled over, stopped, told all of his his uh, his little convoy to stop, and called over and told the Radisson that. Said, oh, "Okay, I'm I'm done for the night. I'm tired. I'm going to bed. We're we're going to stop." And uh, the Radisson said, "Okay, well, uh, okay, no no problem." And the Risley called back and said, "Well, you guys are stopping right too." And the best line that I've ever heard. And these these guys are from far northern you know newfie canada accent which i couldn't replicate if i tried but he says hey when i'm on a roll i don't get up from the table and he kept right on going and and took us all out and uh, we went from being at the back of the pack to being at the front by the next morning so these these guys are good they're they're professionals they they know what they're doing they've uh they've got the boats that are designed for arctic conditions and they're well aware of it and uh, they don't mind showing off to everybody else when, when they get on scene. So, um, okay, you go to the next one. The, the last video I've got, this is a 2017 in the St. Mary's River. The channel here is, it's a 600 foot wide channel, but it's split in half. And we can only use the left-hand side of the channel where the ship is sitting, where it's stopped now. So the this is one of the little 140 US Coast Guard cutters. and. He's basically running through the shallow side of the channel trying to break a relief track for us to get us moving again. It did work. He got us moving. Yep. They'll typically, the these smaller cutters, the, the U.S. side, they'll typically leave them in the river because they're so maneuverable and they're so shallow draft, so they can do this. They can run around us on the sides, and they're really good at grooming the turns and preparing the turns in the river for us so that whereas they might be able to turn you know in, in a bolt length and it takes us a lot more room but they can they can clear out the entire turn for us before we go through they have a it's hard to see there but they have a bubbler system on them too on the sides of the hull so a lot of times if they run up on the ice or they get stuck in a pack of ice you can actually watch where they're pumping this air through these vents on the side of the hull and you can actually watch it break the ice up and the ship will settle back down and then they can take off again. So it's it's a really neat technology that was, you know, these ships were built in the in the late 1970s and, and 1980s. So very, you know, small, but uh, very capable for, for what they're there to do. If you wanna go to the, I think this is one of, one of my last slides. So um, the sun doesn't always shine course. So these are uh, pictures. I don't have the year, but um, from the Roger Blau, single single screw boat, single rudder, and we actually, the rudder fell off going down on the St. Mary's River one time. So the solution, we tied up the spear, showed up a couple days later. We tied up next to the spear. They towed us down to Gary. We unloaded, and then a couple of tugs took us, and the picture on the left is in the dry dock. 
at uh, Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, where they were. They built us a new rudder and uh, put it back on. I think we were in the dry dock for less than a week, five or six days, and they had us back in operation again. But that's that's um, part of the industry that we don't like to talk about a whole lot, um, and it's it's something that we struggle to get across to a lot of the, the newer generation coming in, is that um, partly we like to think that it's because we're, we're pretty good at our jobs, um, but these companies put a lot of emphasis on safety these days, a lot of time and focus and talk is is put on to keeping the crew safe. Um, but still, you're dealing in an environment that is not friendly to people, um, whether it's because of the weather conditions, um, the size of the machinery that we operate. You're talking about pieces of equipment on the ship that are rated in the thousands of horsepower. It's designed to move tens of thousands of tons. And the conversation that I always have with, with new crew members that come on board is, None of this stuff cares about your feelings. You know, it, it has the potential to seriously injure you. And, um, you know, the, the winches and the, the engines and the unloading boom doesn't care about your personal feelings or how great you think of yourself. So um, it, uh, it, it tends to, it can be a very humbling experience for a lot of people. Um, but it's it's a uh, it's a serious conversation that we we still struggle to this day to get across to people. So. But the good part of the job is the the scenery always changes. Um, every day it's something new. Uh, we don't go to a lot of different ports anymore. You know, earlier in my career, the ship traded everywhere on the Great Lakes, and um, just through the, the changes in the company and the nature of the economics of the industry. Um, we, we haul primarily just to two or three ports and docks these days, um, but it's still, uh, it, it's, it's a different experience every day. Um, my wife and I, we have two young children now, and I can say that was a game changer for me. The time away was always difficult. Um, that just makes it that much harder, and, uh, and you, you recognize what all you're leaving at home and what you're missing out on very quickly. Now, the nice thing about working for Keystone and CN, they've invested in their in their boats and in their people, and they put Starlink Internet on all of our ships last year. Um, it wasn't completely for us. It, it was to help out the business side of the company, too, but uh, they, they gave the crews access to it, too. So we have high-speed Internet access 24-7 now. So there's nothing better than being able to call home and FaceTime with your family at the end of the day. Um, or, or make a phone call. There is not cell coverage in the middle of Lake Superior. Um, so it's, uh, it, it, was, it was a pretty nice um, gesture on their part to give us access to that. So, um, you know, Wi-Fi calling and, uh, and FaceTime, um, writing letters is, you know, I, I still get around to it every now and then, but it's, it's definitely not the same thing as uh, being, talk, being able to talk to somebody and see what's going on in person. And that's pretty much all I have. So um, definitely, if uh, hour and 15 minutes, so I guess we did okay there. Um, I hope it wasn't too long. Um, I am more than happy to answer any questions. We can replay any of the videos. We can look at the pictures if anybody wants to. I would be more than happy to talk as long as you guys want, um, if there's anything anybody wants to talk about. And again, um, thank the people. Uh, from, from Virgin's Township and the Historical Museum here in Lowell. They, they really are an incredible group. So if you haven't visited the museum in Lowell, I strongly encourage you to. They have a wonderful railroad exhibit too, so. Thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. Um, not for pay, but... Um, uh, we have three passenger suites on board the ship. We can accommodate six guests. Um, it's at uh, the companies. Um, it's it's up to them. They do raffle off a couple trips through through some various museums and organizations on the Great Lakes. We did not uh, our our passenger quarters were just remodeled about eight or ten years ago, and then due to COVID, they had to shut that entire program down. So um, they just started that up again um, this past year, and uh, I, I think we had we had 
three or four different groups that uh, that made a trip with us. So, sure, you sir. As far as the cost, I can't give you numbers on the cost. They keep that pretty well under wraps. Um, it, it's it's a pretty competitive industry, and they don't really share those figures with us too much. As far as time frame um, loading, we're we're capable of loading the ship in six and a half or seven hours, but that's dependent. It's all dependent on the dock equipment. It's all dependent on how fast they can get the product into the ship. Um, we're so when I talk about that time frame, when, when we go into a dock, we're carrying about 55,000 tons of ballast water, and it takes us about five and a half or six hours to pump that water off the ship. So at the same time, like I was talking about with the unload, it's, it's a balancing act. As you're pumping that ballast water out, you have to be able to load cargo into the ship at the same time, at the same rate. So as long as the dock is able to keep up with our de-ballasting, procedures we, we can load in about six and a half or seven hours unloading if it's into a hopper system on a dock it's completely dependent on them um, so if their system can take on 5,000 tons an hour well it'll take us 12 or 14 hours to unload if we're dumping directly onto the dock the ship's capable of right around averaging around 7,000 tons an hour so we can unload in about nine hours Yes, ma'am. What is the status of the budget well? I wish I knew. Um, you you know, and a hundred percent honest, you know as much as I do. Um, it was uh, it was from what little I know. I've seen some of the reports. The NTSB report is public now. It was published uh, a couple of weeks ago or a month or so ago. Um, it was a catastrophic fire. From what I know. The majority of the damage was on the upper levels. The, the engines were unharmed, and they, the company um, invested a pretty fair amount of money um, to ensure that they were laid up properly. So the ship's still salvageable. There was no hull damage from anything that I know. The unloading system was suffered some significant damage just because of the nature, the way that it's designed. Um, but uh, for the right amount of money, um, I know our company put together a, a lot of engineering and structural designs to, to rebuild the ship and bring it back. Whether that'll happen or not, um, it's hard to say. Uh, she was towed over to Conneaut, primarily from what I understand, to because CN owns the dock in Conneaut, so they don't have to pay the dock fees that they were paying in Sturgeon Bay. So it's their own dock, so it's basically sitting there rent-free. Um, until they, what, what we always say is when, when they tow a ship away for scrap, they paint a white line on the bow. Um, until you see a white line on the bow, um, it's anybody's guess. It's, it's certainly possible. The, the industry's changed a lot, and she's kind of a, she's a one-off design. It's a beautiful ship, um, but she has some real um, inherent design faults and failures to the way, way she was built. Um, you know, she was, she was built by U.S. Steel, you know, going back to that time when they were the biggest and the best around, and, and she was kind of built to kind of thumb their nose at the rest of the Great Lakes industry. And, uh, you know, they, they built a ship that wasn't necessarily economically the smartest thing to do, but um, um, she's a very beautiful design. And one of the big things that we've seen in our industry is the, the change in cargo patterns is... Uh, power plant coal is going away. Um, so whatever side of the political aisle you want to fall on there, as all of these um, all of these uh, these big generating plants are going away from burning coal and going to renewable energy or, or natural gas or, or whatever, um, the transport of coal on the Great Lakes is going away. So that's a significant amount of tonnage that's not going to be there anymore. And then you take a ship like the Roger Blau that <clears throat> doesn't carry as much as a thousand footer does, burns just as much fuel, has just as much crew cost. Um, it's not really, it doesn't compete as well as some of the, the larger ships does. So, but who knows? It's, um, the, the plans are there and uh, time will tell, I guess. So, yes, ma'am.
Um, the Sioux Locks to, uh, for us, it's about three and a half hours. About, about three and a, from um, what, what we call Depart Sioux would be right around Mission Point. Um, it's about an hour down to nine mile and about two hours from there down to Mud Lake Junction. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, it depends, completely depends on the ice conditions. I've seen um, where it's froze from the top to the bottom of the rock cut. Um, you want to talk about living in an earthquake, that's, that's about as uncomfortable as it gets. It's, it's the channel's 300 foot wide. Um, we typically load for 18 inches of bottom clearance. So, um, you know, depending on how the water levels fluctuate in the river, We'll, we'll load so that we have 18 inches of water between the bottom of the ship and the bottom of the river channel there. Um, so you're talking about, you know, going through an ice choke channel, again, sitting on top of 20,000 horsepower. Um, it's a very uncomfortable feeling. Yeah, probably probably about as, as rough as it gets. Uh, so, yeah, in, in the worst conditions, it's, it's pretty tough. Um, but again, that's that's what all that extra horsepower is for to push your way through. So, yes. What's the road difference between you and the captain or as a pilot? Uh, it's pretty significant, really. Um, as far as licensing and credentials, nothing really. They they have the same license that I have. They have that same pilotage endorsement that I have. Um, as far as responsibility, um, legal responsibility, it's night and day. Pilot has absolutely none whatsoever. He is there simply as, in, in a legal sense, in a courtroom, he is there as an observer to offer his opinion. Now, from what I understand, I, I have several, several friends who are pilots, and they typically do all of the navigating themselves. The captain will, will typically let the pilot do all of the work, um, even docking the ship, bring it into the dock and that. If something happens, the pilot has no legal responsibility whatsoever. The captain holds it all. So if that pilot is, if the captain is allowing the pilot to take the ship into a dock and he crashes into the dock and punctures his fuel tank and spills 100,000 gallons of diesel fuel into the Duluth Harbor, the captain is responsible. Now, I'm sure that... Uh, in my unfortunate experience dealing with lawyers throughout my career, I'm sure that any good lawyer would grab a hold of that and would find a way to put some liability on a pilot in that situation. Um, but from my meager understanding of it, um, yeah, they, they don't really, they're capable of doing the job, um, but legally they don't have a whole lot of responsibility. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, not typically, no. Uh, well, so so our schedule, uh, we usually, all of the officers on board were supposed to work a 60-30 schedule. So 60 days on the boat, 30 days off. Um, we're in a situation the last few years, last year in particular, we're very, very short of people. So last year was really rough. Um, I, I kept my vacation schedule the way it was set up. A lot of the other guys did not. Um, if, you, if you live in a, so living here in Lowell, obviously the boat doesn't come anywhere close to here. Um, uh, I could try to get it up the Grand River, but I don't think I, I don't think I'd get very far. Uh, um, so yeah, when, when I'm out on the ship, no, no, I, I, I don't get an opportunity to come home. If you live in one of those port cities where, where the ship happens to go, yes, yeah, you can, you can come and go um, while the ship's you know, at the dock in port. So a lot of guys that live um, in, in Duluth or Two Harbors, you know, in our Minnesota, in our loading ports, um, I don't think I've ever met anybody who lives in Gary, Indiana, uh, <laughs> but um, um, yeah, but you know, a lot of guys on the smaller boats, on the, on the stone boats that live in Roger city or, or Alpena, um, get to come and go home. Um, so yeah, if, if you're fortunate enough to live in, in one of those cities, yeah, you, you can come and go as you please. Yeah. Yes, sir.
Uh, yeah. Thanks, Mom and Dad. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I think you threw him. I think you threw him over the. Didn't you toss him over the the fence? Yeah. That's that is not that is not no 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 no. That is not how I remember it at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't. I didn't get in trouble with security that time. the The next time, when we actually tied up and they opened the gate for us, yeah, I, I almost got arrested that day. But uh, yeah, so I'm sorry. Yeah, what what was? Just ignore him. What what was your question again? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> um, Detroit and St. Clair Rivers are yeah. I apologize if anybody lives on the Detroit or St. Clair River, but uh, yeah, the fishermen down there are, are horrendous. Yeah, um, never hit any, come close a couple times. Never actually run in over anybody before. Um, but yeah, they're they're really bad. And then the uh, um, the sailboat races on Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are that that can be a real challenge. Not so much during the race itself. Part of the wonder wonderful part it's they don't have AIS, but part of their race race committee now they all have to have a transponder on board so during the race you can track them all online so we'll do that and we'll kind of voyage plan around them detour around wherever the the majority of the pack is but after the race when they've all gone up and sat at Mackinac Island and got drunk for three or four days and they're hung over and trying to come back home that's when it's really interesting a lot of them don't especially at nighttime they won't have their lights on you don't know if anybody's even awake or what kind of condition they're in. So um, multiple times we've almost taken out sailboats in the middle of the night. Yeah, coming coming back from the sailboat races. But yeah, so yes, ma'am. Hmm. A couple times. Um, uh, yeah, we, I mean we've seen some some moose and deer swimming across the river. Um, can't really do anything about it, unfortunately. I've I've never been on a ship that's run over any of them before, but I've heard about it. Unfortunately, that happens. I know, I think it was last year or the year before. I'd ask my dad, but he'd start talking again. And uh, um, I know they had a moose at the Sioux Locks that, that they were kind of watching. Um, I know one time, a couple of years ago, we were loading in, in uh, Two Harbors, Minnesota. I think I was on the Callaway or the Clark at the time. But the uh, one of the we watched and a, a guy that was getting off the boat got walked down the ladder, got on the dock, just stood still for like 10 minutes, just standing there. And he was a rather large individual. And uh, then all of a sudden just took off running. And uh, when he came back to the boat and we kind of asked him, say, hey, Keith, you know, what, what was the deal? He's like, didn't you see that big effing black bear that was standing right there? So. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you, you run into that. You see a lot of eagles. That's that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, a lot of eagles in the St. Mary's River. Um, so uh, one of the guys, a uh, whole different story, but a uh, really good friend of mine who was first mate on the boat. He's a big fisherman, and he used to fish all the time, you know, and when we were in, 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 uh, in port, and we were way back at the beginning of my career. Um, we were unloading in Nanticoke, Ontario, and I was – eating breakfast in the morning, getting ready to go to work, getting ready to go and watch, you know, like 7.15 in the morning or something. And he comes walking in with a mud puppy. And I don't know if you've ever seen what a mud puppy looks like. It's an ugly looking fish. And uh, comes in with this thing hanging off of his fishing pole, parading through the galley. Hey, look what I caught. Look what I caught. Like, wow. You know, that, that pretty much took my appetite away. Um, so, yeah, fun, fun stuff like that. Yeah. Yes. Go, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You're first. <clears throat> Depends on who you ask. Um, so it's it, it's it's a lot of it's a lot of investment. Um, yes, it's um, 
you know, we're, we don't pay for the icebreakers. You know, we do. Everybody does, you know, independently through our taxes and all of that. Um, the Canadians and the U.S. side work together. And, you know, obviously we don't do anything to fund the Canadian side. Um, from a competitor's standpoint, yes, because when our customer, when the dock is sitting there and saying, okay, it's, it's uh, you know, March and we're running out of product, we're almost out of iron ore and Gary, and we really need to get some product in here. Well, if Great Lakes Fleet goes out there and American Steamship goes out there and Interlake doesn't go out there, well, then they're not, you know, U.S. Steel is not going to look to Interlake anymore. They're going to say, well, they're not reliable. And, you know, when our boats, you know, we might, our boats might cost a little bit more. I'm just making this up. I don't know for sure. But, you know, if, if we cost a little bit more, but we're the first ones in line waiting to get out there and get going and our customers see that, yeah, it, uh, from a business standpoint, you know, it, it, uh, it's, it's valuable. It's, um, it's, yeah, you have to do that cost benefit. Um, where the potential to cause damage to the ship, the wear and tear on the ship is significantly more operating those conditions. Um, but is it worth it to take that extra little bit of risk to, to be the fleet that delivers the first couple of cargoes to Gary Works and U.S. Steel? Um, most of the marketing team would probably say yes, absolutely. Yeah. And as long as the taxpayers keep paying for the Coast Guard, um, yeah, heck yeah. So. Uh, so we burn on average about 15,000 gallons a day. Um, so yeah, so our typically, uh, we fuel at the dock right in two harbors when we load in two harbors, which is why we do load there the majority of the time. Um, a typical orders around, uh, 90 to 95,000 gallons. And that's, that's for one trip. That's for a six or seven day voyage. So she, she holds maximum fuel capacity is, I want to say it's around 160, 170,000 gallons. So we can almost, we can't quite make two round trips. We, we basically be sucking fumes at that point. Um, but uh, yeah, so we, we have to fuel every trip. And yeah, it's, it works out to right around 15,000 gallons a day. It's number two diesel, exact same stuff that you'd put in a, you know, a truck or my dad burns in his outrageously large pickup truck. Um, yeah. You know, exact exact same kind of diesel fuel. So, yeah. Are you running up to Texas Gary? Yes. Yep. Yep. So we'll we'll transit loaded downbound and then upbound we come back in ballast. Yep. yep. Yes. Just yeah, just north of here. Yep. Yep. Um, wherever the ship is. So, uh, it. We, we try to, to change at a dock when, when the ship's actually static, when it's tied up somewhere. So um, we typically load in Two Harbors, Minnesota, Gary, Indiana. Gary's actually um, not, not a bad place to get on and off the boat as long as you can just get out of there. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, rental cars. Um, yeah, a lot of times um, you kind of make arrangements with the, with the other guy that's, that's getting on or off and he'll bring a rental car and then I'll, I'll drive it home and drop it off here. Or if that doesn't work, yeah, you fly, get as close as you can fly. And, uh, the airport at the Sioux is not very big, but, uh, yeah, fly up to, yeah, fly up to the Sioux and there's a couple taxi companies up there. Um, um, done it in Detroit a few times off the, the mailboat in Detroit, um, yeah, just wherever wherever the boat ends up being. So we have a, um, a travel agent out of Florida that they work with maritime companies throughout the entire world. So we're actually pretty. It was it was difficult when we first started working with them because they're used to flying people from, you know, Austin, Texas to you know Abu Dhabi or something to to get on a boat in the Middle East. And and you try to explain to them, yeah, I got to go from Grand Rapids to Duluth, Minnesota, and they're like. Where's Duluth, Minnesota? So, um, yeah, it was. It's uh, it's pretty small, small potatoes for them. But they're they're actually really good people. Now they, we worked with them for about ten years now, and they're they're actually really good to work with. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
Um, a couple were, uh, we're actually the only boat in the fleet. We get all of ours from a company called Aloise Marine Supply. We get all of our supplies, groceries, um, all our deck supplies, um, uh, engine room supplies. Their Aloise is out of Superior, Wisconsin. So wherever we load, whether we're in Two Harbors or Duluth or Superior, we get all of our supplies up there. Um, the rest of our fleet and a lot of others do it through Sioux Marine Supply, through the supply boat Ojibwe up the Sioux. And the reason that our company does that is just to provide a little bit of competition between the, the different companies, between Aloise and the Sioux. And then that way they're, they're keeping both in business too, so that we're not putting all of our all of our groceries in one basket. So if something happens at the Sioux, we've still got another supplier in Aloise that, that the rest of the fleet can use. And then uh, um, the mailboat, J.W. Westcott, the guys down there are fantastic. They'll, they'll do grocery shopping for us um, too. And then there's another company out of Alpena. I can't think of the name of them right now. It's a, it's a maritime supply company, but they're out of Alpena. And they'll service a lot of the stone docks, Roger City, Stoneport. Um, a lot of, a lot of the boats that go in and out of there. Mm -hmm. I'm not real familiar with scrubber technology. We didn't, um, our fleet didn't invest in that. We looked into it a while ago. Uh, one of our big competitors, Interlake, is much more um, on page with that. I've heard several different versions. So, yeah, we burn a lot of fuel, 15,000 gallons of diesel a day. Um, and just like everybody's cars and the airplanes and the power plants, all that's going up into the atmosphere. Um, it is... So we've transitioned away from um, the heavier fuels. The, our engines in particular um, were designed, they, they can basically burn anything. So when they were, when they were first put on and the older engines that, that we used to have burned what was, it's called IF320 or IF180. It's a very heavy, unrefined black diesel oil. You look at some of the old steamships like the, the Arthur M. Anderson and the Alpina, um, the Ryerson, if it were ever to fit back out, burn number six black oil, which is about as toxic as you can come to. So, um, yes, we're still burning a lot of fuel. Um, it's a fraction of the pollution of what it used to be. The trick with the scrubbers, and again, I'm not an expert on this, I know there's several different versions. Some of them, from what I understand, produce a byproduct. They produce an effluent. And that has to be dealt with some way. So some of them are designed just to dump it over the side. Some of them collect it and have to take care of it somehow. Um, now, I'm not saying that anybody's dumping all that over the side either, but... Um, you know, stranger things have happened. So no matter how you look at it, no matter what, how you're dealing with that, there, there are negative side effects to, to burning a fossil fuel. So, oh, tremendously. It's, 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 um, fractions of a percentage. Num number two diesel compared to, I don't know if anybody's ever seen IF320 before. You, you cannot pump it. It's, it's worse than road tar, this, this heavy, unrefined diesel fuel. It, it has to be heated to about 250 degrees in order just to pump the stuff. Um, so much, much higher BTU content, much more bang for your buck. Um, but yeah, you're, you're dumping thousands of tons of garbage into the air, burning that stuff as compared to number two diesel oil. And if you look at it another way, um, yeah, okay, so you're, you're going to get rid of the ships. Well, this cargo is still going to be transported somehow. So how many train engines does it take to move 60,000 tons of iron ore every six days? How many semi-trucks on the roads is it going to take to move all that cargo? So marine transportation, still the cleanest, most efficient way of transporting these cargos. Yes, sir. Uh, I have absolutely no idea. Um, 
they transitioned to oil long, long before my time. Um, I, I honestly, I, I would be offering just a complete guess. Um, most likely knowing their reputation and uh, um, I, I'm trying to, the, the Kinsman Independent and I'm trying to remember the other Steinbrenner vote, one of their last ones. Um, I vaguely remember those from our numerous trips to the Sioux Locks, um, but they they were all diesel by then. So yeah, it would it would have been a quite a while ago. And again, I don't know a whole lot about Lake Michigan Car Ferry and the Badger. I know that they've undergone some significant changes. Um, you know, environmental concerns. They don't dump any of that coal ash over the side anymore. They contain it all on board. And, and deal with it. Um, I know there's talk of repowering her um, natural gas or, or going a different route. So again, a lot like the Roger Blau, time, time will tell, so, yeah. Yes? It, it is through a reduction gear. So there, um, it's an air clutch between the, so the, the engine RPMs are, um, I'm drawing a blank, it's around 450, 480 engine RPMs, uh, shaft RPMs 120. So it'll run through, out, out, through the, out through the engine, through a reduction gear to bring it down from the 450 to the 120, and then it runs through an air clutch where that actually clutches onto the propeller shaft and then shoots that out through the hull then. <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure if it was Wisconsin, it'd probably be even worse. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't actually know where the horn came from, to be honest with you. I know that uh, a couple of their their um, high school stadiums and some of the, the more professional teams up there actually have air horns from some of the retired Lakers. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's that's a good question. Oh. Yes, sir. Yes, yep. We uh, we all have satellite TV. Everybody has their own in their room, and uh, yep, yep. We have we have satellite TV, and now that we have high speed internet too, so yep, you can uh, you can download and stream whatever you want. Before uh, the Starlink was put on this this past fall, it, it was it was a challenge. Um, uh, you know, you, you didn't get cell phone service very well, and when you did get it, it, it wasn't the best. Um, but we, we've had satellite TV for 15 years now, about, about that much. So, yeah. yes. Yes, yes. I think we were, we were scheduled in for about three weeks, I believe, um, I don't know the entire winter work slate, but I know she's getting a paint job. And they, uh, they were pulling both propeller shafts. Um, where the, the shaft penetrates the hull, there's a series of seals. And we've had a lot of problems with the seals the past couple of years. So they're looking at a, a different version of that. So that's supposed to be put in. And then she's undergoing her, her uh, six-year Coast Guard inspection as well. So, yeah, she should be out. Um, Probably within the next couple of weeks, I would imagine. Yeah. Anybody? How do you sweep up the uh, It um the the best way. So uh, there's the mail boat in Detroit. Um, we can get some mail through there. The best way to do it is at Sioux Locks. Through the, there's a Marine Post Office right at the Sioux Locks. And since we're, we're traveling through there every three days usually, um, so we get mail there all the time. So, no, it's, it's amazing um, how little there is. They actually talked, the Postal Service talked this past year about closing that mail, that Marine Post Office down because it's not used nearly as much as it used to be. Um, so you can attribute that to smartphones and email and uh, uh, internet access and not not too many people actually write letters anymore 
and do that. Um, but we still we still get it. And um, yeah. Uh, it, it depends. Um, it's all seniority based. It's all unionized. So um, every year, everybody gets to pick their preference for boat, and then it's it's all based on how much seniority you have, which boat you get assigned to. Um, so everybody kind of has their their favorite ships that they like to be on. Um, you know, obviously, you get along better with certain people. You know. Some guy might like a particular captain or chief engineer and not another one, so they're going to avoid whatever boat he's on. Um, some people like to be on the bigger boats that have longer runs, like the Gaunt and the Spear. Others like the smaller boats. Um, the guys from around, like the Roger City area, tend to stick to the smaller ships because they go into those docks a lot more often. Um, so it's a uh, crewing it, it, it's it's a huge issue. It's industry wide. It's not just on the Great Lakes where it's an issue. There's a tremendous shortage of seafarers worldwide right now. It really came to a head last year. Um, everybody, we we had a lot of struggles in our fleet um, finding enough people to man the boats, and then on top of that, finding people to relieve them so that those guys could get off on vacation. I don't think we sailed with a full crew after June of last year. Um, we were always short uh, at least one or two people. So uh, it's, it's, it's definitely a problem. Oh. Yes. No, that's, um, uh, and you don't even have to do that. That's uh, just for the officers, just for the mates and the engineers. You can still call up one of these companies and sign on as an entry level position as a deckhand or as a, as a wiper in the engine room. Um, with absolutely no training whatsoever. Um, and, and the way things are right now, they'd pretty much take anybody. So uh, you need a Merchant Mariner credential and a TWIC card from the Coast Guard and pass a physical, and that's even a little bit of a gray area these days. So, um, yeah, the, the Maritime Academies, that's, that's just to to train the, the officer corps, whether it's uh, mates or engineers. But even that, you don't have to go through one of those. Um, the, the first mate on the boat, probably the best first mate that I have ever had the pleasure of sailing with, he, they call it hawse piping, where they start out as a deckhand and they work their way up to AB watchman and then wheelsman and then write their mate's license and, and work their way up through the ranks. So um, it's a very experienced based industry it's it's a uh, there's only so much that you can teach in a classroom or having a conversation or, or looking at a computer um, there's no substitute for experience so those people that work their way up through the ranks um, tend to make you know exceptional mates and engineers when when they get up to that point Hopefully we're getting a, a third horn too. So, yeah. Hey, if if you're gonna be a boat nerd at two o'clock in the afternoon when the sun's shining, you're gonna be a boat nerd at two o'clock in the morning when it's dark outside. I'll I'll make I'll make sure of it. So, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> um. 99.9% .9 of people are absolutely fantastic. I mean, absolutely wonderful. All of the, the pictures and, I mean, just the simple fact that all of you came out here tonight to listen to me talk for two hours about, you know, sailing, um, it, it's, it's, it's a humbling experience. And the general population, um, and I am not a people person, you know, my, my parents would attest to this. Um, the general population is absolutely fantastic, respectful, um, you know, knows that we have a job to do and they're, they're just there to enjoy it. And I cannot stress how wonderful of, of an experience that is. Now that unfortunate, very, very minute, small minority are the ones that give everybody a bad name. And, um, there's, there's just, there's nothing you can do about it, you know, and our job is not 
Um, it's not unique to us. You know, everybody deals with that. You know, the airline pilots that have some idiot, you know, shining a laser pointer in their eyes. And, um, um, you know, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's part of the job. And, you know, you, you do your best to keep a level head and, and uh, you know, stay professional and, um, yeah, deal, deal with it the best you can. So it's, you know, it's, it's a big lake and it's there for all of us. I mean, we might be the, the biggest boat out there, um, but there's plenty of room for everybody. And, uh, you know, we were talking about the fishermen and the sailboats and, you know, if, if everybody just, you know, respects each other and, you know, acts the way they should, they're, you know, I, I know that's a pipe dream, but, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of room for all of us. So, yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for coming this evening. And um, I'm sure Captain Elfson will be happy to stay and answer any remaining questions. Um, be on the lookout. Our next program is in March. So um, we hope you'll come and join us at that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.